got here a signal ground. Now use the signal ground to put your grounding wire from your turntable. I'm going to turn mine into a little hook, put the wire on there like that, and screw it in like just like that. Next, I'll unhook up my turntable into my MPC 4000. This is your RCA inputs right here. Another one. Right there. You got to make sure you only put turntables in here. The reason why they've got some sort of phono equalizer, which is applied to compensate for the frequency response of the signal that comes in the input here at these jacks. So these jacks are only good for phonos only. Put your turntables in and that's it. Now here we have a switch. This input switch will select either the phono section or the line in mic record section. This side is for line and mic. Now a line section is a really cool connector right here. You can either use a Phono jack. It fit real good, nice and tight too. Or, say I got a microphone, I've got an XLR plug. Let me get one for you. Here's an XLR. I'll take this and pop it right in there. I've got input from a mic line. Now, a MIDI is Musical Instrument Digital Interface. I can use this cable an input or output. I may want to input a keyboard part or send that keyboard part out to a module or to another media receiving device. Here, I can put it in as two. I can put one here and one. I can have two MIDI ins. I can also get a little MIDI cable, so the MIDI out to other instrument, in and out. Is the section right here. We can run the main out from there to our speakers or to our main mixer system. We can use XLR or over here we can use cord wrench. This of course. Now, of course we use a female to the male to get our output to go XLR out to our main output. This is really cool because you now either have an XLR or we can use a quarter inch. This is a USB cable. My other end goes into my computer. I'll take this, make sure I got it right here, and use a USB cable. Next. This is a USB cable. My other end goes into my computer. I'll take this, which I got it right here, and use a USB cable. I want to show you a SCSI drive. How is a SCSI? Here's a SCSI connection first. Now SCSI we use to move, I guess, transfer data back and forth from some sort of storage device. Okay, like this. Snaps right on. And take it out. See these little snaps, these little quick bits. Take it like this. Let's put it on. Okay, now I'm going to show you a zip drive. Now we like to use a zip drive with our MPC 4000. Because we have a lot of our own sounds, our Sample Kings discs we use with our MPC. Now we have a 50 pin, I showed you earlier. And here on the back of my SCSI is a 25 pin which I normally, like I told you before, will just hook up right there. Got a foot switch right here. There's a cable for it. I'll plug it right into here for a foot switch. Now, SEMTI was invented by the Society of Motion Pictures Televisions Engineers, and it's called a SEMTI code. Now, we can go input, and we can go output. And we use the code to sync our MPC 4000 with receiving a SEMTI code or sending out a code to another device that will receive it and will interpret the code so that device will be in sync with our MPC pattern or sequences. The digital RCA cable is right here. 
so we can record into our MPC digitally. We also have, as you can see right here, our outputs. Those outputs are for setting, let's say maybe a bass drum, or a snare drum, a hi-hat, a kick, or a sample, sample loop, out of these outputs. And you can see also, it's one, then two right, one left, two right, three left, four right. So we can set in stereo pairs. We have four pairs, or we have eight separate outputs. We also have a system known as 8ATs, which are really cool. Uh, if you got them and you can use them sometimes, we don't use them anymore in our studios. We tend to use a lot of Pro Tools, but we do dump from 8 -ads. So here we have a light pipe connector. Let me pull these little plugs out. So we, right there, we can plug a light pipe cable directly into our 8 -ads and record digitally again. We can light pipe in and light pipe out. We have our own tags on here so we know. See this 8 out there? And DD7 there? We can record from separate systems, or ADAT, or DA7. We can record light pipe in and out of our MPC. This is a really cool feature. And we also have a word clock, which will lock up our sample rate. That goes like that. Let's this cable. This is the cable here. Inside there is a little wire that goes inside. Take this, put it on the edge. And we lock it in. And that's our word clock in. The power goes, thanks, O, right over here. Right there, our power cable goes in. Put that in last. Now, once you're set up, you're ready to go. Okay, here on the front, we've got a couple of connections also. We've got a USB connection right here. And this USB connection, it allows you to use like a USB CD-ROM or a movable drive or even a USB keyboard. It's really cool. And right here, as for, of course, our headphones. And we also have a little turn the dial and we can adjust the headset level. Now here, to get some extra money, you can insert like a 3.5 disk drive here. And on the other end here, on ours, we have a CD-ROM. So we can read CDs into our MPC 4000. Okay, here we have our LCD display, which is backlit. The reason why is because we have five different positions for it. We can have it up like this. See that? Now below our LCD display, we have our F buttons. F1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Now these are like a quick key button. You can use them to access certain pages in certain modes on our MPC 4000. Okay, now we have our gain switch, which is to the right of our LCD display, which is right here. And you push it in for high gain. That means we're going to add more gain to the input in our mic line. Now high is for your microphones, your mic level. And pull it up. Low is for a line level or for your phonograph. And you put your turntables in. Now next to our gain switch, we have our record gain. Now record gain is really cool. As you can see here, I can turn this knob like this, and they both move. There are left and right gain. The top part is the left, and the lower part is the right. As you can see from the diagram, right below the knob. So we can turn it up, increase the gain, or we can Adjust it. Let me try this. See, I've got one higher or louder than the other one. I can bear. Now we have our master volume out. We can go from minimum to our maximum and adjust our level that we'll hear back from the MPC. Now, here we have our quick link section, which is right here. You can assign internal MPC parameters or MIDI messages 
to the knobs and sliders of this section and control them in real time. This is really cool. Now, for example, here, this key acts as the Q-Link setup page where you can select the parameter that will be assigned to each knob or slider. Here, we have the sequence key. Now, this key acts as the Q-Link sequence page where you can record Q-Link values and play them back automatically. Now, we have these four Q knobs. Now, they control the change uh, or any difference in internal parameters can be assigned to these knobs, allowing you to control the values in real time. So I can turn this knob and say, make that one active, make this one active, and the prior one here, make that one active, and we can make them active and control either parameters in my setup or in my sequence, like right there. That's really cool. Now here we have our pad section. These are our pads. Now these pads are 1 through 16. These pads are velocity sensitive. You can hit it soft or hit it hard to get the right velocity to it. Or you can set it to be full velocity. Press that key right there, you hit it, and you hit it soft or hard, you get the full sound of whatever sample, drums or whatever horns or bass line or this, that, whatever you got there will be that same full velocity. Now on top, we have our pad bank keys. Now we have 16 here. Well, in B, we have 16 more sounds. In C, 16 more. In D, 16 more. All the way to F, which is really super cool. We can have a lot of sounds in here. Now, we also have our next sequence key, which is right here. We go to the next sequence. After one sequence plays, we can choose the next sequence. We can use our track mute key. Now, we press this button here. Certain pads are set for different tracks from 1 to 16. You can turn that track off, or turn that track off, or turn that track on. You can mute a track within the sequence. Now here, on the side, we have our Q-Link sequence key. Now this key is an on-off switch for our Q-Link section we showed you earlier. We have our pad assign key. Now this key assesses the pad assign page where you can change the note number of that particular pad. For example, this could be C60. I may want to make it C62. I can change the assignment of that pad by pressing this key, and we'll see it in our screen display. And, of course, we have our full level key you saw earlier, and 16 levels. Now, when you use this key, you can, like, change the sound of a specific pad will be assigned to uh, 16 pads, to say, for example. I may have a sound like a violin. I can play it here. It could be soft. I can play it here. It could be loud. 16 levels. 16 different levels, or I can use it for 16 different tunings of the same sound, which is really cool when you got a mix or you're trying to make a, a, a hi-hat soft in one section or loud in the other one, or your bass line soft and loud here. It's really super cool. Next, we've got our erase key. Now, this key is used to erase events from within a track. Now, events can be erased in real time while overdubbing, or individual events can be erased while the sequence is stopped. You'll say, for example, let's say we have a sequence. We'll press erase, uh, hold it down during that sequence while it's playing in real time. I'll erase that one section. See, hold erase, hold the pad I want to erase from. That's super cool, man. Just like an MPC 3000. We also have our note repeat key. Here, our note repeat key. When you hold down this key and press one of these pads, the sound assigned to the pad is triggered repeatedly over and over again. Lift the pad up, it stops to be repeated. That means a note repeat. Press this, repeat that note. Press this, or can repeat this note. Or repeat that one, or repeat this one. It's really cool. It's a great way to really sort of flip your samples. Now we have our data entry section, which is right here. We can enter data through our numerical keypad. These keys are used to input numerical values directly into our MPC in the particular field that's displayed. 
Let's have our enter key. Once you put the values in, you want to say, enter that value in. Well, we enter it in. Let's have a plus and a minus key. Now, this key switches the sign, negative or positive, of the value that was input in the numerical key. Let's say put number 2 in. What well, we want a minus 2? Minus 2 might even be minus 2 in tuning or in pitch bend. Now, next to our numerical key, we have our mode section. In this section, you can switch between various modes of our MPC-4000. And this new machine has a lot of modes for you. We've got our record. We have our sample. Go to our program section. Multi. Mixer. We can have our effects. We can save the data. We can load it. We can go to global parameters. We can pick our song section. Miscellaneous. We have our MIDI section for our MIDI input, of course. We've got our main screen. We have our sequence edit and our step edit. All designed to help you get through certain modes in your machine in case you want to go from recording, you may want to go to MIDI. You may want to go to, let me save this data now. It's really great. Now here, in our control section, we have, first of all, our timing correction key. This key is really cool. Now when it's lit, this key activates the timing correction that is set at the particular note value in that particular sequence. Here we have our master tempo. Now, when this is lit, all sequence will play at the one master tempo. When it's not lit, each sequence will play at its own tempo that it's already been set to. If you made a sequence that says sequence one is 90 BPMs and sequence two is 92 BPMs, they'll play at their own tempo. But when master's on, it'll play at the one tempo set at master. Sequence undo. Let's say, for example, you made a sequence and you put a part in, and you don't like the part you did. You press the undo sequence button. Next, below the undo sequence button, we have our tap tempo button. You get the tempo of what you want to get for that particular track. You may, I want to make it faster. You tap the tempo in, and it'll show on our display, and that'll be the tempo you want to use. Now, we also have here in this section, we've got our window key. Now, this activates a window on a particular page. Let's say if you're on a page and you go to a different field, well, you can hit this window, it'll open up more parameters within that particular page. Now next, we have our shift key. Now this key is used in conjunction with other keys, you know, to get to a sort of shortcut. We can shift and move around. Then we have our cursor keys. This allows us to move the cursor up and down, or side to side, left to right. Next, we have our block cursor. Now, if the current display page is divided into blocks, you can use these keys to switch from any block you want to switch to. Next, we have our step key right here. That's a step event key. Now, these keys are used sort of move back and forth within a sequence in units or in steps of a particular song. By holding down the go to key and pressing one of these keys, you can move an event that's immediately before or after the next current event. So you press the go to and then move the next event or the next event over two events. An event would be like a, a snare drum or a hi hat, or maybe even a, a sample in one section. Maybe to move the step over to the next section. Now, the go to key, this key is used to move the current location. A specific locate point or to access that locate window where you can register a, a, a locate point. It's really cool. You can get to that one point you want to get in the sequence where you press this down, you can locate that point and move it either here or move it with your bar keys. Now, our bar keys, these keys are used to move backwards and forth within the sequence in units of, let's say, one measure. By holding the go-to key down, you can move to 
that specific measure. Next we have our record key. Press that key down. See the light up there? We're ready to record. And when you hold this key down and press record, you're going to record over what's every recorder already. When it's starting to record, you can start to record by pressing that key down and press our play button. Play start. Excellent. And we're ready to go. Press the stop. We're ready to go there too. Next, we have our overdub key. This key is really important because once you record something, you want to overdub. Let's say you record a bass line or a drum part. You want to more add more stuff to it. You want to record over that. You press your overdub, press your play start, and we're ready to go. And we're overdubbing what we already have. Here are our stop key. Stop it. I can go record, play. I want to stop. It's pretty obvious. Next is our play key. We got our sequence. It's going. We press our play key to play. Also have our play and our play star. We can play from where we are or play from the beginning. Okay, we've got our setup going. We know how to put the input into the back of our MPC 4000. It's time to start sampling. I'm going to press record. And here we go. Now as you can see here, our first option, move the cursor over, is our input source. Now our input source is whatever we have connected to the back of our MPC. It could be a CD player, a microphone, a turntable, or whatever. We could use the jacks to record in mono, stereo, and even digital. Now, we can do digital input. We can also use the main output of our MPC and that will be connected right to our sampler and we can record the main out. We can also record through the light pipes we saw earlier in the back of our MPC 4000. We can record through the ADAT light pipe in stereo from 1 and 2, 3 and 4, 5 and 6, and 7 and 8. These represent stereo pairs. We can also record into our MPC 4000 the internal analog input. In this case right now, I want to record analog in. Next, we have our mode. We can record in stereo, mono left and right. We also have bit. We have a bit depth of 16 bit or 24 bit. We can also monitor the input source. This means we can hear back what we're recording. Or we can turn it off if we don't need to hear that. In my case, I want to turn it on. We also have original. What original represents is the actual pitch when we sample that when triggered, that sample will play back at the original pitch we sampled it at. For example, if we had a keyboard connected to our MPC and we hit the key 60 C3 or C1, I can make any pitch I'd like to on that keyboard the original pitch that that sample will be triggered at. For more information, always read your manual. Next, we have, this is a great feature. I love this feature. It's called Auto Normalize. Now, what it actually does, um, let's say you have a input that's very low. Well, you want to make sure it comes out loud enough. When you go to Auto Normalize, it will raise the level of whatever you record to 0 dB, which would be the maximum threshold level, the maximum peak of that sample. Next, we have the threshold level. As you can see, those two little boxes moving back and forth and left and right, as I increase it from the minus up to the positive side, the threshold moves up higher in dB, and they're at 100 dB right there. 
Here, we're at the lowest, which is minus 56 dB. We set our threshold level so that once our input source surpasses the threshold level, our MPC 4000 will start to sample. Next below that, we can set the time of how long we want our MPC to sample. As I turn my wheel, in this case, in stereo, I can do 33 minutes and 19 seconds. That's excellent compared to the old NBCs. I can also record starting threshold or I can go to manual. In this case, I would just press F6 when I record and no matter how loud or how low the signal is, the NPC will start to record and record for whatever length I have set for my MPC to record to. Set my length, I'm ready to record. Now, I'm going to go to my recording setup window. Now, in this window, we can actually set a bit depth and we can set our pre-recording time. Now here what we actually do is that pre-recording has to do with the actually the specifics of how much is actually recorded prior to the actual recording. For example, we have our threshold level set up. We can have just a few milliseconds prior to that so our MPC can start recording before then. So we don't cut off the important first hit of any sample we're actually trying to record. For further information, just read more in your manual. This is going to explain to you further about what I'm about to do. I'm going to increase the amount of milliseconds I can take, and I think a maximum one here is 999 milliseconds. That's really great. I'm going to go to about maybe, oh, I prefer to be about maybe 300 milliseconds. Right around here is perfect for me. I like this. And this will be my pre-record time prior to sampling when I'm actually sampling in my threshold start. Close the window. And so as you can see, we have this threshold level here that moves up and down. Well, prior to that, it will start recording just a little bit. Right before the sample reaches that threshold level, the recording will start. Once it passes, it's already gone. And we're going to have the first part of our sample recorded more accurately. You need to experiment and to adjust how you use your pre-recording level. Okay, I'm about ready to record now. I've got my setup going. i got my bit depth. It's time to get started. I'm going to start one of our Sample King CDs. I'm not going to adjust the record gain. trying to get a little bit louder. I like to record the peak optimal level. As you can see here, oh yeah. Well, I want to record manually first and we'll get an idea of that first. I like that one. Let me rewind it. Press F6 to record. And I can stop by pressing F6. I start recording. It's now processing. And we're auto normalizing our sound, as you can see. Now I have options also. This is a keep or retry option. I can name the sample. I can keep this recording and press F6. I can add to the program, which keeps the sample and adds it to the program I like to use it in. 
I can also play it by pressing F3. I can also retry. Okay, next I want to use record start using a threshold setting. In this case here, as you can see, we're set the threshold. I'm going to set my threshold dB level to about minus 36. Next, I'm going to set my recording time. I'm going to take about a couple of small samples here. So I figure no more than about mm, 30 seconds. Now here you can see below our screen we have a margin which is called our margin level. This is the level between the actual 0 dB output and the sound going into our MPC 4000. I'm going to turn on my CD player and pick the samples. Okay, I'm ready to record. I'll press F6 to record. As you can see right now, in the record ready window, it says waiting for input signal. This means we're set up, ready to go, but the MPC 4000 will not start recording until it receives our input signal. Here we go. See? And a recording. As you can see the meter go through, it's recording the full timeout. All the way to the end. And now it's going to process. And I have auto normalize set. So now it's going to adjust the level of our sample to the peak volume. Now, once we record, we have our dialog box again, whether to keep our sample or to retry. And as you can see there, we can rename our sample. To do that, let's turn our jog wheel and we can rename, rename our sample. We can rename the sample whatever we'd like to. We can press enter once we have a name we'd like. And we have other options below. We can keep this recording. We can add it to a program and keep it. We can play the recorded sample or we can discard this recording and try it again. Now, first of all, I want to play it back. Sounds good. Okay. Now, to keep is very simple. To add to a program, is what we're going to do next. I'll press F5 and I can add this to my current program. I can select the program. I have a Hyatt City, I have a bump set, a Jeep set in my program. I can put in my kick set. Or I can make a new program. But first, I want to probably assign it. I'm going to put it in a new program. I'll go to Assign to Note. Here I can go to 60 C3, which in general MIDI equals high bongo. Or I can press a pad to assign the sample to that pad. I can press my first pad, second pad. As you can see, I can assign my sample to any pad I like to, and each pad corresponds to a particular MIDI note and number. In this case, we have 55 G2, which equals general MIDI splash symbol. I can also turn my jock wheel to assign it to the original pitch again. Now, do it assigns it to the program, and it will be at that pad that I choose with that particular MIDI note. I can also create a new program. So I have a whole bunch of new samples 
I may want to use for one particular song. I can press F4 and I can name my new program. In this case, the MPC has already named the program Program 3. We can also set the type of program. It can be a drum program where I would store my drum sounds like kicks, snares, hi-hats, and drum loops. Or it can be a key group program where I can store bass sounds, guitar parts, or any particular synth sound I like in case I want to rearrange it into a key group so I can play it from an external keyboard if I'd like to or use the pads to trigger the sounds. In this case, I'll leave it at the drum group. I can press do it. And here we have it, again, to assign to this program. We can assign the pitch, in this case he's 60. I can press the pad and do it assigns to the program. Do it and I'm assigned to the program and I'm right back where I started, ready to sample all over again. Okay, as you can see here, we're in our sample edit window, which means our trim window. And to get to this, we of course we press trim, which is F2. And I can see at the top, I can select any sample I want to select. As you can see, the waveforms are changing. I can pick any sample. And you can see also here in the lower half, we can see where the actual start is of that sample. Back to my original sample here. I can also select the view, or right, or left view if I'm in stereo. And if I have a sample that's not stereo, we have a right left view. We have a mix of either one. That means it sees it no matter whether it's mono stereo is left or right. As you can see here, that means mono. We also have our kilohertz. And of course, the 16-bit bit depth. And we can monitor the sample or monitor the program with the multi. Now we're going to go back here, up to sample. This is our start field from where the sample starts from. This is the end field to where the sample ends. Here we have our loop section. If you want to loop a particular section of our sample, we can set the loop parameters, as you can see here. And we can also set our playback mode. Well, it's one shot, which means we hit the pad once, the sample will play from the beginning to the end one time. Or we can loop the sample. We can hit it one time and it'll loop straight through. You must hold it down though. You've got to hold it down to keep the loop in progress. Now right here is our display field. It shows us the loop we're displaying the shift in blocks, see the blocks and diagram. And we can also zoom in, in or out. We can also select play the whole sample, which is F6, or edit the sample, which is F5. The cue effects and our region. Now we also have a playback mode, it's no loop. With no loop, I can hold the pad down, but the minute I let go, the sound stops. So we control the actual sound by how long we hold the pad down, but it won't loop. While in loop mode, if you hold the pad down, it will loop. Well, now I have my sample, but I want to pick what I want to use. I want to edit my sample. So we must press sample. Okay, here we're in sample. That's my first sample I took. Now, as you can see here, 
This is a sample list. It has all the samples that are currently in my MPC 4000. And as you can see here, there's an asterisk right here. You'll see an asterisk next to all samples that either have been edited or are new samples. Now here, we can see it as mono or stereo or as a loop if it's set to loop in our edit menu. We also have the frequencies that our samples are at. For example, 44.1. My 808 dope bass drum is at 30K. We can also see the bit depth, which of course, 16 bit. Well, I have the sample I want to use. Next, I want to trim that sample down. I'm going to press F2. Here I am in F2. As you can see, I've already set it to loop. I'm going to turn this off. I've got one shot set. I can actually set my start point. As you can hear in the bottom window, this gives us a, a stronger view of our start point. I can move to the end, and here also we see a much better and clearer view of the end. But if I start, I can increase it. Now see it's going in small increments. As you can see the bottom part move. I can press shift and then the cursor, so my left cursor, and I can move up to get even more increments and move in larger divisions. As you can see, the first part move all the way to the end. Now, I can get the end, press shift, my cursor left, and I can get even wider and view my entire sample. Now to play, I can press F6. It'll play the entire sample. Then the last part. As you can see, this sample I did not auto normalize. Just so I can show you the range. See how this is louder here, the first sample, the space before the second sample appears. One part is louder than the rest. You can see the peaks and valleys of that sample. See this here? Same here. This way you can tell how loud your sample is. Also, I have it at one shot. I have it a loop or no loop at all. In my playback mode. Now, I want to get this sample here. I like that better than the rest of them. I go back to start, press my cursor, get it back up to start, press shift, my left cursor arrow. I can move my start all the way over there. See that? That's really cool. Right, well, let's go right back in and move it all the way over to right there. I'm getting close, but I want to make sure I'm just right. So now I want to adjust right where the start happens. Hit my pad. Okay, great. Next, I want to get the ending. I'm going to bring my cursor up just a little bit right to about there. And next, I'll press shift and my right cursor, so I can move in smaller increments and get just close enough to the edge of my sample. As you can see, we're trying to get real close to it. Look at the bottom screen, you'll see, you'll see it getting closer right there, I'm gonna move back a little bit more just to where the sample dies out. 
I want to get closer and closer back in. Uh, maybe right about here. Perfect. As I hit my pad, I can see I have the right amount I want to use. But now I want to set my loop up. And so as you can see, my start is good here. But I want to make sure I have the right size for the loop. I want to go to 603385. I'll press my shift, my left cursor, and I'm going to go to the maximum. See how it's highlighting? It's going to hide the entire amount. There we go. To the maximum I've allowed already in my trim setting. Next, I can press a pad. And my loop is set. Now, if you think you want to adjust it, in my case, I might want to adjust a little bit. I may want to bring this in a little bit more. So what I'll do here is I could bring my loop in this to here more if I'd like to. Maybe right about there. And I'll go to here maybe and press the pad. I feel it's rushing right there. So next thing I'll do. is maybe a little bit more. I like that. That sounds good for me. Yeah, it's perfect. And so you can adjust your loop. And if I don't want to use loop, I just go to one shot. And it'll play, once I tap it, it'll play to the end of the sample. Okay, I've got my samples. I want to probably put them in a program next. Well, I've already created a new program earlier called Program 3. Well, now I want to check it out. Press Program. And here we have my Program 3. As you can see, it says Drum. It's a drum program. Now, I'm going to scroll down. Here we are at my next level program. I'll press F2. And here we can see the samples that are in my program. Move the cursor over. And we can see my first sample is beat. Next one's a 909 kick. Hip snare. We've got a shaker, close hi-hat, a beat loop, a horn. A rim shot, another beat, and a dope 808 kick. As you can see, these samples actually have level and tuning. You can see I have level. How loud? I have panning, whether it's to the left or to the right, using, of course, my job wheel. Or in the middle. We can also set the output of that particular sample, or zone as it's known, in the MPC 4000. Now we can use multi, or left and right, one and two, three and four, five and six. Since the sample is stereo, it will send out in pairs. Or we can send it just left, right, one through eight in our outputs. And with our effects card, we can also send the amount that we want to send into our effects from 40 dB all the way to 0 dB. We also have our send. We can send to our effect either multi or not send at all or send just to the first channel of our effect, the second one, which is B, the third one, which is C, the fourth one, which is D, or we can set it in pairs out to our effect, A and B, or C and D. Now here, 
We can also go to pitch, which is F3. Now here I can set the pitch of my sample. I can set it to whatever pitch I think is best for that sample. And I can keep it constant. We can also set we want to be poly or not. In this case, I don't. Or turn the mute roof on or off. Okay, now I'm going to try to explain some pages on this program field. I can move back to uh, key group mix. Move my cursor to this key group field and press window. Now here we can see the program. We can see it's note 38D. We can see the pad that it hits is A6. The program. I can even copy it to that program. And information can be changed. See? You can see what each note belongs to each pad. We can see which note belongs to which pad. I can press do it and I'll copy the parameters. In this case, I'll press escape. It's just to show you how it works. I can also go here, press window, and we can get information about our sample. We can see the sample rate, the bit depth, and we can change the original note. And we can see the tuning of our sample. We also can see the looped sample, where it says looped, and it says ST for stereo mono. I'll close this window also. Now here I have a new program. As you can see, we already have a key group written into this program. I can pick whatever sound I want or whatever sample I'd like to put into the program. And each one of these samples corresponds to its level, panning, output, the effects, amount of dBs, and the send to which effect. So, you can add your samples to your program. Well, here I am in my program list, and I want to create a new program. This is how it's done. I will press Window, and you can see I have several options. Program name, and drum for type, copy. This will open copy window, and new will create new program. Now I want to do a new program. I'll press F5. I have a new program. I can call it a key group program or a drum program. In this case, I'll make it a drum program. I can rename my program. If I like what I want to use, I'll press do it. And there it is. Okay, I've got my program here, already made up. Let's call my next level. This will be the next video. I can hit the pad, as you can see, and it goes right to it. If I want to change the level, I can move to here and change my level. So once you assign your samples to your program, and you've got them in the program, and you want to adjust them, you can just hit the pad. So you've got to sign to, maybe lower the level, raise the level, or change the panning to that program. As you can see here, that's what we're doing right now. I can increase the level. And get my level where I want to have it at. By hitting the pad, I will trigger the sound. I can also, of course, change the pitch of my samples. 
I can make the 808 a little deeper if I want to. But you can hear it pitch down more. Okay, first thing I wanna do is check my samples. It's pad 15. A wave of 14. Got my horns. Snare drum on 12. Hi hat on pad 11. Ooh, cool hi hat on pad 10. Loop on pad 9. A little sub bass sound on pad 6. Kick drum on pad five. So first I'm gonna take this one. Oh, that's cool, that's from the Johnson Brothers. I wanna try and record that one in. Okay, I wanna hear that back. See, I'm in sync there. I've already pre-timed out everything. I'm set to 84 BPM. I got my next try. Eight away. That's kind of cool. My track could be my hat. Got a few something programming. My shaker. Oh, let me set that back up now. Got my shaker going in there. Record on track number three. So I'm shake my hi hat. And my snare from track number four. You gotta make sure your parts coincide. I'm one of the Silver Kings and it was behind the camera. Well, of course, this is our second video called The Next Level. The NPC 4000 Next Level video. You gotta buy it. Hey, you got it. This is it. We're gonna teach you a lot of stuff today. We're gonna show you about time stretching. We're gonna show you about how to get your beat so it's bump a little bit, how I can sync back and forth between one thirty-second note or a 16th note. How to use triplets, how to quantize and when recording a keyboard player, we want to make sure we have the proper MIDI information being recorded into our MPC 4000. It's a hot video. I can talk all day and you know I can, but I'm going to get back to getting busy. Uh, we'll take it a minute. Guys, cut the camera. 
Hey, I'm gonna get this thing really hot. I got this sample, fellas. Let's check this out. This is kind of cool. You can to see just a little background. Oh, hear more going on now. Hear that? I don't even hear a beat. Watch this. Oh, there's a beat somewhere. See, higher pitch, double pole. Ooh, nice. Hear the beat now, look at that. I filtered out the beat. I filtered out the low frequencies and got the highs. Sometimes with a sample, you might want to do that. It's kind of funky, it's the way to go. We can change the LFO. Way to go, LFO. I have rhymes, amazing. Hey, forget about me, let's show you. We've got a sound here. I kind of like really like this sound a lot. But what I want to do is I probably want to get rid of the beat from the background. I want to use the MPC 4000 to affect this sound, to use some filters, and to give it the kind of flavor I want to give it before I use it in my track. First thing you want to do is you want to go to our program list. Now here in program list, I want to select the sound and where it's at. As you can see, we can move our cursor up and down. And we're here at demo. Next, you want to go to KG Mix, which is our key group mix. And here, as you can see, once you hit the pad, we're right there. And that note is D flat one. And we're at N loop. You can see it right there. Now here, we can adjust the level, the DB, we can raise it up or down. We can also adjust the panning, whether right or left. We can adjust the output. And of course, we can adjust our effect level, dB-wise. Right, we want to set it to zero for our demonstration today. And we have our send, we're going to send our effect to. We're going to send it to A. Next, you want to go to Okay, now let's go to our edit one window. Now here, on the top block, we have our program. And we have a curve we can set to linear or log. Of course, it's the type that the program is. And here is the level of everything in that program. We can also set the tuning of every sound in the program. Let's change the tuning. Everything in that program, as you can see, as the sounds come up here, as we keep hitting the pad, it affects all the sounds in this program with this tuning. That means you can tune everything in the program. That's really cool. Now here, on our second block, we have the pitch, which is D1, and you have the edit 1, zone 1, and the actual sound we're going to use. We can also change the pitch. Now here, this changes the pitch of the actual sound. See, that sound changes, but nothing else in the program will change. Next, we go to our filter section. This is really cool. We have a choice of a whole lot of filters here. We're going to flip through them here. You can see 4-pole, 8-pole, 1-pole, high-pass plus, 2-pole, high-pass. We've got notch, 2, 3, notch wide, bi-notch. These are all different filters that you can use to affect the sound. We'll hit the pads, you can hear several of the filters and get an idea of what we're talking about. See, that cut the bass out and gave us the really high end of this harpsichordy sound. Well, that's really high end. Here's a low high, that's kind of freaky cool, right? Low high, here's a low bandwidth. Here's a band high. Here's a notch one. It's a notch too. So see, we're affecting the sound with this filter. And the filter sort of adjusts the sound for us. Now we're going to pick a sound, or a filter rather, that's going to help us to adjust the sound. Because I really don't want the drums, and I already have a drum beat already made up. I want to just get this little harpsichord sound within the rhythm. So we'll hit the pad. I like that. Now I want to maybe add a little more of that bass into it. So we're going to change our cutoff frequency. See what happened there? 
by using our cutoff frequency, we brought back in some of the bass. This was at 100 before. Now it's at 85. We brought back some of the a little more bassy sound of the actual sound without bringing the drums in. Now below that we have resonance. Now resonance sort of adds a little higher end, ringy, whiny type sound to me. See that? Now if you leave that there at 20, and we go down here to our attenuation and turn it up, it'll sort of lower it from outputting too much. So our attenuation works in conjunction with our resonance. But for our demonstration, we only want it to be zero. We don't need to have to have all that on there. It's just for reference for you. Now here, the other half of our filter section, this section right here, you can adjust the certain reference levels here for our attack, sustain, decay, release. And it'll affect this little diagram you see here. See that? Moving here, we're changing the attack, the decay, the sustain, and release. It's a release going up. Is it release going up? Release is way up. Release is down now. You have to learn how to adjust it to the setting you would like to use for your particular production. In our case, we want to use the setting we have here right now. Now, below our filter section, in our filter block section of this edit one, we have the amplification section. Here we can amplify the sound, the level of this sound right here, the end loop. I can get it louder now, or even lower. See that? So we can adjust that particular sound right here in our edit section. We can also set the out to multi, or left and right, or one and two, three and four, five and six, and seven and eight. Obviously, stereo. We can also use an effect along with this filter. This is really cool. I like this part here. This is funky. We can have the effect sent to, let's say, A. We can set our send level, which we have at zero. Now, watch this. We're going to go to effects. We have an effect picked out for our send A. We have a delay mono setting. We're going to press edit. And see here, I've already chosen 333 milliseconds as my delay setting. I got a feedback of 30 and a high frequency damp of 20 kilohertz. Of course, my pan is midway because I want to hear the sound bounce back and forth. Great. Next, we'll go back to our main screen. And we'll play the sound. Hear the echo? See it bouncing back and forth? The echo is going back and forth. I like that. I think it's a little effect for me to have in the background of this sound. Now I'll play the beat along with that sound. And I've got a beat going along with this great, cool sound now that no longer has a drum beat behind it. Now this is how you can use your MPC 4000 to filter and affect the sound to give it your flavor that you want to give it. We're going to show you edit 2. We're going to use our low frequency oscillation. And here we go. We have here in this block our low frequency oscillation. The top two blocks remain the same. But here we can adjust these LFOs. We can do sine, square, saw. We got saw down. We got random. Oh, we got so much stuff here. It's so cool. We can do the depth, the rate, and the delay, which is really funky. So now, first thing we must do, we must assign something to this LFO. We got to press window. Now, here in window, we have LFO 1, as you can see there. We need to assign it to a particular destination. We can use amplitude, pan, pitch, LFO rate 1, depth. We can assign it to phasing, offset, rate 2 for LFO. We can assign it to almost any parameter we want to. This gets even more complicated later on. But the real idea here is to show you how it works so you can apply it to the use of whatever you're doing for your music. And it's important also here in this section to go to depth. If it remains to be zero, you won't hear how the LFO is being affected in amplitude. This has to be either plus or minus. 
In our case, we're going to make it plus 100. So you hit the effect even better. We'll close this window. And now, we're going to set a depth and use triangle. I'll hit the pad. Okay, now we want to pick a rate. Hear that effect? It's sort of going in and out. It's changing the amplitude and this rate, as we increase the rate, the faster it becomes. Hear that? A little cool like that, almost like a DJ, you know, moving that little uh, volume fader up and down real fast. That's really cool. We can even add delay to that effect. That's just really funky. And just delay the effect behind the effect. Now, we did that with this LFO. We'll do the second LFO, which are low frequency oscillation too. We'll go back to our open window, and we're going to assign this LFO here. Instead of being amplification, we may want to go to pan. So that effect will be panning back and forth. We want to set our depth over here also, which you can see, which is 100 already. Now we'll close that window, and we're going to affect LFO 2, and we can use our depth. Now we're using 100 so you can hear how the depth sounds, it's really accurate, this way you can actually know what's going on, but you should always try to adjust it to how you feel it should sound and what kind of flavor you want to add to your track. Now we have a rate also. Well now we'll hit the pad. Now it's going back and forth in the speakers. It's panning back and forth. That's very heavy affected now. And we're doing this so you can get an idea of how to use both these LFOs to make that particular sample sound have a different flavor. Now here in Zone, these parameters remain the same in our edit window, but here we can pick a sound and put in the zone. We have a particular sound here we like. That's a hi-hat we got there. That's really cool. And we have the level, we got the panning and the mold which comes out, and here we got a range. The range has to do with how hard you hit the sound. The range and whether we change it or not. It means you hit the sound, it's going to hit all the way to the top end. See that? We hit it real hard. And that's our sound. Well, we want to make it do two different things. I want to have uh, hit the sound when I hit the pad soft, and I hit the pad hard, I want to have a different sound. So here, I want to put like maybe like an open hi-hat, a little bit more of like an 808 um, hi-hat that goes there. I don't think that one there might be it. Aha, an open hi-hat. Now, now we're hearing both of them hit the same time. You're hearing both of them. I don't hear that, but watch this. We're going to change the range of these sounds. We'll make the first sound go from 0 to 75. And we'll make the next sound go from 76 to 127. And now. So if I hit the pad hard, I'm going to get this open hi-hat sound. If I hit it soft between 0 and 75, I get the regular hi-hat sound. This is really cool with hi-hats. That way, when you hit your hi-hats, you can change the sound by the way you hit the pad. This can also be done for kick drums. You can take a kick drum. And here we've already done it for you. We've got a sub kick and we've got a low sub kick. We're going to take the first kick and make this one go from 0 to 75 again. We'll take the one below that and go from 76 to 127. And now when we hit the kick, hit it soft, one sound. We have two different sounds. And what you can actually also do, you can keep this at 0 to 127, keep this the same way, and use both kicks at the same time to make your kick stronger. If your kick sounds a little weak and you want to bump that kick up, you can actually combine kicks to make your own kick drum sounds. This is really cool. Now the lower half here, we can 
affect each one of these zones. Like this is the zone for this kick. We can change the tuning of this kick here. We can change the constant of this thing, of this actual sub kick. We can also change whether it's a one shot or a loop. If I had a loop, they could change that. We can change each zone and the effect for each zone, like as you can see here. You must adjust, check it out, and experiment with your MPC 4000 to give it that flavor, like I said before, that you want to have. Ha <laughs> ha! Hanging out, still trying to get the beat right. Well, look, we're going to do something new. We're going to use the Q-Link section. This is the newest thing they made. This whole you know, thing with the knobs and the faders. Ooh, faders. Whoa. You can use this to make your sounds sound a little funky, a little more flavor, a little more of this. Use them to actually touch parameters and turn parameters. Ah, I'm talking a lot. Check it out. That's what you're going to do. You don't understand. What is that? We're going to hit the track now. Play the sequence. We got a beat. We got our harpsichord sound. And now we're going to add some little effect to it using our Q-Link section. First, I'm going to hit Setup. Now here in Setup, we've got to have our cursor right here on Multi. We're using Multi 1. Now here also you can see each one of these knobs corresponds to 1, 2, 3, 4. Well, 1, 2, 3, 4. And the two faders, 5 and 6, are right here. I'll move them up and you can see them move right there. That's cool. Now below Multi, we have this Q-Link 1 section. The first part here is called Part. We can affect all the parts, that means everything for all the parts, or just one, or part two, or part three, or four, and so on. Now below that part, we have Assign. Now here we can actually assign a parameter, like Amplitude, which means volume. We can pan it back and forth. We can change the pitch. We can also change the LFO rate of one, LFO one, two, three, phase, the biphase. We can change everything. Look at these parameters. This is amazing. It's a great machine. You can change so many different parameters in our assign. Back to off. Now below that we have type. We can replace or offset. It has to do with the way we turn our knob. Read more in your manual to understand this properly. Now here we have a range. We can select the range from minus 100 to a plus 100. That means we can take this knob and bring it down here to the bottom here like this and we're going to be at, wow, minus 100 from where we were before or plus 100 from where we were before. So you have to make sure you understand where you are in your sequence and in that particular sound how far you want to actually affect the range of that sound. Below here we have control. Now as of the date of us doing this tape, Control has yet to be assigned a particular uh, parameter by Akai. We suggest you go to the website or get a new manual, if you have a new manual out on it, and check it out. For this video, we're using 1.4. That's the operation we're using. The system operation. Well, the system, well, whatever. You know what I'm talking about. Next, we have MIDI right below here. This is MIDI 1. A. Now we have to go up here to part. If you turn part, you'll see this change. It's two, three, see that? It's changing. As we change the part, we can change the MIDI channel. If you have a MIDI channel assigned here to a particular instrument, you can change the effect of that instrument. It's really cool. And the same thing happens also here for the fader. The only difference here is there's a fader here and a knob here. Well now, we're going to try and affect the sound, probably the harpsichord sound, and do something to it. We're going to set a part first, which is part one. We're going to assign a parameter. We're going to use pitch. And then we, I want to assign a range. I don't want to get to go all the way down and go really low and I want to get a real short range. I want to use like minus five. I'm going to turn my jog wheel to minus five. And then I'm going to go to plus five. So I want to get a short range, not too big a range. So I can change this pitch within this particular range. Next, I go back to the main screen. Yeah. And I want to make sure what track I want to record this to. I want to put a blank track right there, track eight. Next, I go back to setup. And I want to like press play. 
and see. See me change the knob here? So my range is just about right where I want it. So I can change the pitch of that particular sound. I put it back up and down the middle, it's the pitch that I naturally had it at. Okay, now I'm going to record this data onto this particular track. We're going to press main screen. We're going to press active, which is the button right below the Q1 knob. The light comes on green. We're going to press record and play. Get our metronome going and turn the wheel. See, it's recorded right there in the sequence. It's recorded right here in sequence A. And I can actually mute that sequence. Mute what I just did by pressing the mute button here. And it's back to normal. So we record that data on this particular track. That's really cool. Well, now we can do it to another instrument. We're going to maybe change the volume of a different instrument. We're going to press setup. And next thing we're going to do is pick the... Let's see, Q-Link 5. We'll select the part. And we're going to assign amplitude. So we can control the volume of that particular sound. That's really cool. We're going to probably activate that button below it. It says active on Q-Link 5, where the fader's at, right below the fader. We're going to press main screen. And we're going to pick a new track to record new data to. But first, I want to turn up the other track first. I want to turn the volume off first on the track 8. So let's mute track 8 first. And the mute is on. See? We're going to mute what we just did. So don't get too confused. Now we're going to go to track 9. And on track 9, we're going to record this new amplitude data for the drum sound. We're going to press record and play. See the drums come in now? Perfect. Now I can actually mute this I just did. Mute it. See the drums play straight through the whole track. So what we did here is that we recorded that data from the Q-Link section onto that particular track you want to use. Okay, now we're going to use the Q-Link section to affect our sounds, but this time using note values. First, we're going to go to Setup, and we're going to use our fader this time, and we're going to assign it to an actual part. We're assigned to part one. We're going to assign amplitude. Next, we're going to press Q-Link Sequence. Now here in Sequence, we can either have knobs, or we can use the faders or sliders as it says here. Well, I want to use Q-Link 5. First of all, I'm just probably activate Q-Link 5. I'll put Q-Link 5 on by pressing F5. Good. And then next, what I want to probably do is set up the sequence. I'm using sequence 1, as you can see right there, it says loop. And below that, I have a step. Now, the step sets up my note value and how it affects here from 1 to 16. In this case, I'm going to use eighth notes. Great. Now we're at one. I'm going to move the slider up. And that volume's going to be that high. I move it over now to three. I want three to be high. Move it to five, five, seven, nine, eleven, thirteen, and fifteen. So we have an alternating up and down, up and down, up and down. Next. We're going to go back to um, main screen. We're going to activate our Q-Link sequence by pressing the button. And we're going to press play. See so go in and out. Now we can actually go back to Q-Link sequence. And we can change this eighth note. Watch this. So it's up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. See that? That's like a DJ there, right there. That's like 
130 seconds. That's really, really cool. We can even change the parameter. Wow, it's still playing. We'll press setup again. We can change some amplitude. We can go to tuning if we want to. Ooh, that's ill. That's the tuning, see that? And that has to do the same with the sequence. It's just affecting it in the same way. And we can do panning. And that's how it works. Okay, this section is all about taking one sound like this and slowing it down but keeping the same pitch. See, it's the same pitch, just slower. That's even slower, but it's the same pitch, a thick and snare. Otherwise, if I did this and used tuning, see the pitch, it changed. It's slower and it changed. This is about time compression. Now watch this. As you can see right there. First, we're going to move our cursor here with the cursor to end and change it to beat. Now as you can see here, it defaults automatically to 120. We want to get it to be 8 beats. Now play the sample, see how long the sample is we want to get. 2, 3, 4, 2, 2, 3, 4, stop. Okay, that's 8 beats. Now as you can see here it says 10, that's wrong. Now first what we're going to do is we're going to change this parameter right here. And we're going to move the cursor back over to beat. See how that changed there? It became 9.73. We want to be 8 beats. So this is wrong. Let's do it again. And you keep going back and forth and you click on beat again to see if you're at the right amount of beats. See that? We're getting closer now. There we are. We're now at 8 beats right there. Our tempo for this loop is 91.2. Okay, look, we've got our BPMs right here. We believe it's 91.2. We're close. We're not eight beats within that period of time for this tempo. We're going to now go to Region. We'll press Region. And next, we want to edit. We're going to BPM. And as you can see here, we've got a tempo of 91.1. So, as you can see, the NPC suggests us to do a 91.2. As you can see, and it claims that this is going to be the best this particular loop. Our new tempo will set here in new tempo. Now as you can see here, these are the examples of time stretch, but there's no pitch change. We said earlier. Now here we have a preset of percussion A. We can also go to, let's move the cursor down there. We can also go to percussion B and C. Now C is the best possible way that we can do it, it may take more time to actually edit that sample and to shrink it down, but it's the best possible situation. A is the fastest, and B is in between either one of them. Read your manual to know what's going to go in. Read your manual to be sure of what I'm talking about. Okay, let's time compress that. Hold on, wait a minute, we've got to adjust here. Stop. We also have adjust. Here we can adjust for a little variance, you get a little bit plus or minus into how much you want to actually adjust our sample, upward or downward. In this case, we'll leave it at zero. Okay, let's do it. And now we're processing that sample to become a new time-stretched sample. This is very cool when you want to take a beat and slow it down but keep the same pitch. Let's put that sample right now. I like that sample. I may want a little faster. So instead of using a BPM, we're going to use edit and go to our time stretch mode. See that? We're normalized. We turn the cursor dial and we're in time stretch. We want to take this sample and sort of make it faster a little bit. Here we go. We go to amount. We're going to set it to 50. We're going to set our vocal to vocal A. Now, A is a faster time for the PCU to use it. Now, A helps us to get the sample faster 
but it's not the most accurate time stretch. B is a little faster, and C is the best possible time stretch, but it takes longer to actually make this actual file. For our purposes right now, we're going to use A. We'll press do it. See, it's processing pretty fast. If we use C, we'd have been here for a few minutes. Let's play. Play! Play! Hear, Hear it again? Play! That's shorter than what it was. The same pitch, though. That means we could be in the same key as we were before, except it's faster. Play the original sample now. Play! See? You can either time stretch using BPMs or time stretch using percentage. Some stuff on my beats stuff you don't know about, son. We're gonna mix some stuff up for our own flavors. We're gonna take a beat, a sample from here, a vocal from here, a bass kick from this record. We're gonna get a horn from over here and a guitar. We're gonna make up a little track, a little something like we you know, something you can dance to, something you can listen to. We're gonna show you how we do it and how the pros do it. Sound pretty cool. I'm gonna do this here. I'm gonna run a little pattern here. I'm gonna set myself up on a brand new track. I'm gonna do a beat here. I'm gonna try and get this beat going so that really I can make it rock. Press record and play. That's cool. My tempo's like 90.9. I want to put a snare drum. I'm going to pull the overdub off here. So I can start to record something. I'm going to do like a hi-hat first. Just bang the hi-hat. like a, you know, a harpsichord there with a drum pattern, boop, boop, boop. I'm going to try and cut the drum pattern back a little. I'm going to try and filter that sample. First thing I want to do is I want to press program. And I'm making sure here for my list that I'm in the program I want to actually be in, which is my demo in this case. Next I'll press key group, hit the sample I want, and I'll press edit one. Here in edit one, I can actually change the pitch of the sample. As we saw earlier, but I'm gonna put the right pitch I want to have it out here. I'm making it up zero, 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 zero. And what I want to do here is pretty much just take this sample and sort of EQ out the bass. I'm gonna to go to this filter section, and here in the filter section, I can change some of the sounds. See that? I'm changing. I'm sort of filtering the sample around. So a little, little sound, little sound's missing, not so heavy, but I've got a sound I like, I can mess with here. I can take that same sound, as you saw earlier in our tape, I took the sound, made the right tempo I wanted to have it at, and I know the loop speed is. Go back to edit window. I can put it right here in the first beat of this two bar phrase that appears here as the first beat, the first step on this track. Go back to the main screen. I'm going to play this. I'm going to put a 
uh, carpenter. Yeah, I like that. Okay, so we're gonna put the carpenter back in here now. Yeah. Right here, yeah. I took some samples and chopped them up the way I want to use them, of course. And I can use a bass, for example, and a keyboard over here. We have a keyboard on this side, so pan this way, turn these pan this way. So it's a keyboard. It's a keyboard, right? I can go back down here. I've got these sounds that are already in the MPC. These sounds are from General MIDI. I put them in part six here. That's a bass sound I'm going to use. Make a bass line for this thing. I'm going to press like, uh... Let's record, play, two, three, four. Got a little pattern in. And play, start. Okay, I'll make a beat up real quick, sort of a hip hop type style beat. I've got my drum going on here, my same, a different actually um, pattern, but the same sort of sequence type pattern. You got that there? Got a bass sample here. Tracks going here is kind of cool. I can like remix that same beat around. I'm gonna mute those tracks right now that we just added. We're gonna mute this guitar here next. I'm gonna go to track mute. And here in track mute, I can pick whatever pad I want, which matches the track. I can pretty much just put the vocal back on, turn the bass off. I can put the other keyboard on. Go back to let's say this uh on the track. See? I can put it to my mixes also. Great. 
drums, Bubba. Horn. I'll take it up again now. Turn the fuzz off, turn the bass off, bring back the hopster board. When he tracks off here. I'm sort of mixing the tracks that I have from two different ideas together by turning one track off and the next track off. That's how you can sort of mix your stuff in to get a really good idea of how your music's going to sound for different flavors. We need a keyboard player. We're gonna get the Triton to be midied up with the MPC. We'll get a MIDI cable out of here, into here, to record MIDI data, then out of here, back in here, to trigger the sounds. Yeah, that'd be cool. Let's get a keyboard player. Now first, we wanna plug a MIDI cable to our MIDI in input on our MPC 4000. Next, I want to send a MIDI out from MIDI out of A. Get right there in A. Okay, now let's go to our Triton. Next, we're going to plug a MIDI in cable, which is connected to the MIDI out of the MPC 4000. The MIDI out of the MPC 4000 will now go into the input of the Triton keyboard or the keyboard jam at home. Next, I want to get the output of my Triton to go into my MPC 4000. This way I can record MIDI information into my MPC 4000. We're going to make a beat up right now. I'm going to pound the beat out on my MPC 4000. I'm going to put on a specific track in my sequence. I got a track, I got track one, I got this beat going on. I'm using my uh, Timbo set from uh, one of our uh, Sample Kings MPC 4000 CDs. I like that, not bad. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Guitar. Oh, a little acoustic guitar, that sounds good. Let's, let's record that one in. Let's record first and bend on the mod wheel. Well, good. Up and down, let's up and down. Go down now. Okay, let's try to record some of this track. Don't play, just use the mod wheel as you hear it back the track, alright? I'll press solo, I'm gonna press play. I'm gonna record that. I'm going to press overdub, play start, here we go. Great. Let's hear it with the track. Okay, I want to save this beat here. A little level. So I like my beat, I want to save it. Here's how I do it. I'm going to press save. Next I'll press utility, which is F2. 
move my cursor up to where it says memory to CD. Now see normally when it starts out you may be in delete but in utility we can go delete, white volume, quick format, full format, and memory to CD. And once we get there we want to make sure that we're going to save our sequence data. Now here we have a selection. We can save sequence type. We can save all sequences in songs. That means every sequence of song in our MPC 4000 or we can save just the sequences if we'd like to. In this case, I just want to save the sequences. We can pick our type and we have our type. Now if you want to save all, you go to all, you go to file name, and you turn the cursor, and you could name the entire file. See that? You can name that file. I'm going to cancel out of this. And now, we're going to go here with this blank CD, the lower half. And here, in mode, we can test the burn and write. That means we can practice the test, make sure it's going to burn properly, and then write the CD. Or, we can do a test only, just to test to see if this CD can be written. And we can also write only. I'm going to do write only for now. We can also adjust the write speed of our CD. See, our burner can be adjusted to 8 times, 16, and 4. We'll leave it at 4. You can also name the disk in this section. See where it says MPC Backup? We can change that name. I'm going to make it say just MPC 4000. That way I'll know what disk it is. Press enter. And right here, see this number here? It's a date. This is actually 2003, the fourth month, the 18th date. So it's real cool. You can save your files according to date if you'd like to. Or you can go here, turn the dial and name that folder where it says new disk name I've named it MPC 4000 next level and the folder is MPC 4K NL now I'll press do it to burn my CD now it just built a directory so it can find out how much data we have here we have used memory is 16.6 megabytes. That's how much memory has been used already in my MPC 4000 and that's how much I plan to record to the CD. The free space on the CD is 702 megabytes. That's 702 megabytes. We're going to save whatever multis we have here. It saves the programs, you see the amount of samples, and the number of sequences. And do it will save the data. Let's do it. And now we're saving our data. Now the first thing you want to do is get a USB cable. Connect your USB cable to your keyboard or your free open USB port. Now we got a USB cable. We're going to plug this in into our MPC in the USB port, which is right there. Let's open the file up. And we have Akai Sys 2.53. Open that. Then the installer. Continue. Of course, agree. But you must read it.
Yes. Now it says here that it might have to restart the Macintosh once the software is loaded. So we want to do that, of course. And now we're loading in. Great. We're going to restart. Once you have the Akai Sys on your desktop, you need to open it. Click on the Akai Sys application. It'll open. It says Akai Sys could not find any S, 5, or 6,000 samplers. Press OK. Click there. As you can see, it recognizes your sampler. We click on multis, and the multi that I have in memory is multi one. We double click on multi one, and here we have faders and sends and outputs and inputs to work our MPC 4000, except with software this time. We have fader levels, as you can see in the middle of our screen. We have solo. We can mute that particular sound. We can even pan it back and forth in a stereo mix. We can set our outputs with a stereo or mono. We can also turn effects on and send them to A through D or A, B, C, D stereo. Those are sends for the effects. And we can control those effect sends with the green knobs there. Exactly. That's really cool. Above that we have, we can fine tune and adjust our parameters. We also have a MIDI section. Wow, look at that. Out of any MIDI output you want to send it to, 32 altogether. Post programming. And you can change the MIDI priority note. This is really cool here. That's amazing. Click on programs. Next, we can pick a program we want to use. Either one. Here in the top part of our menu, this affects the entire system, the entire program. We can affect the tuning, we can transpose, we can do the output, we can pitch bend, up and down, and after touch. We have portamento, glissando, and we have our global parameters there also, as you can see. And the zones, we have zones. Below that we have our key group edit window. You see all these keys right there, like a piano. Now, right there below, we can have our zones for our individual samples. We can click on that sample one. We can go to assign and pick a sample. The sample loads. And you can see the pier in zones, in one. We can change the level, the panning. So it's just like our regular MPC 4000, except now we're able to control these parameters with a mouse. We can control filter key group, as you can see here. We can select our filter type, which is really cool. Cutoff frequency, the resonance, and you can see the attenuation right there at the bottom. And we also have this key group section. We can affect the levels, the send, and we can also affect the FX level, where the output's multi, off, or A, B, C, or D, or a combination of A and B and C and D. Yep, we have envelopes also. We have amplitude, we can use filter, and we have an auxiliary. We can do LFOs, LFO1, And LFO2. We can shift. We can change the phase. 
the depth, the rate, and delay. And we also have modulation. Here we can assign, for example, an effect and, and assign its destination. Like we can have the velocity affecting the cutoff, or velocity affecting the pitch also, as you can see here. We can change that to anything we'd like to in, the, in our list of parameters that we can actually affect. And here we're going to use LFO1, and we can designate LFO1 to affect amplitude. Now, if we want to edit our samples and transfer them, maybe onto our computer desktop to use a different editor, we open up samples, we'll pick the sample we want to edit, we'll use our mouse, we'll hold down on it, and we get the menu, and it says save to Mac. So we're going to save to our desktop. We pick the file, or folder we want to save it into rather, Here's the folder. We choose it. And now that sample appears as a QuickTime file here in our folder. But it's the same sample. Let's say you got another software you want to use. You grab the icon to the MIDI file, you drag it to your destination folder. Drop it in that folder, and then you can open the folder up. And you see it's a MIDI file. Okay, now you can even open your hard drive up. And you have all your sounds there. That's everything's on that hard drive. You can see it right there. What's on here? You can take it off. You can store your hard drive onto your computer hard drive to back it up. So if you've got a big hard drive inside your MBC 4000, this is a great way to store your data on some other device. You can even do that with a zip drive. Don't be intimidated by what you see when you bring up the software. These are the same parameters we showed you earlier in the video. But I guarantee you it's much faster and smoother and you could access your parameters and see how they work much better on a computer monitor. Well look, thanks again for buying the video. I hope you learned a lot about production and how to use certain facets of our MPC 4000 to make our music come alive. And if you want to learn more in the future, visit our website at samplekings.com and join the online school. It's pretty cheap. We've got a lot of new tricks, reviews on new machines, and how to use certain techniques to make your, I guess your MPC or any sample you're using sound great in a production. So, I'll check you out later.